You're listening to HTO Football. I'm Andrew Timbrell, and for this episode, Tom Whitford and I sat down with two of the Sunderland Till I Die's production team, Ben Turner and Richard Cook. We wanted to find out why the Netflix documentary series has been a huge hit with not only Black Cats fans, but also supporters across the globe. Welcome to HTO Football, Ben and Richard. It's fantastic to have you on. Um, how, are you, how are you both? You well? Yeah, really good. Really good. Very well. Yeah, I've been enjoying the sunshine, which mm-hmm. now, summer, now summer is officially over. <laughs> yeah, it is over. Today was, the, that was it, wasn't it? It was, it was May and then we're done. We're done. We, we were yeah. done with the weather. Um, before, before we sort of dip into sort of some, some specifics, I wanted to just get a, get a flavour from both about how, how things have been going um, in the quarantine slash lockdown a little bit, maybe Ben from yourself yourself on on forward 73 and actually sort of how work has been able to go on if indeed it has and a flavor for himself as well Richard. Um, sure. It's been a very strange moment because simultaneously it was uh, really difficult to do any work and all of the broadcasters were desperate for stuff <laughs> so uh, it was a kind of strange um, moment. It's been um, I've been, I mean, personally, I've been incredibly busy uh, having the kids at home as well. I know Richard probably had the same and trying to juggle all that with what is already a pretty busy work day. Um, it's been very, very full on, but amazing in some way. I consider myself, I count my blessings in it because, I, you know, everyone's having their own mm. challenges. And I believe the challenges I've got have a lot of upside to them. So I mm. feel very lucky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, like Ben, I've got I've got children, young children as well. So actually, although you know, balancing parenting and work is is difficult. Just just having them around because my I've got twin daughters who are two, so actually, you know, they're they're changing all the time. So at least being present or around and and seeing things that they're that they're doing has been you know really fortunate. But um, you know, in terms of the timing. For, for individual projects I've been very lucky because we not only finished Sunderland but starting a new series which we can't talk about but um, starting a new series we were about a week or two away from beginning filming so fortunately the broadcaster has stuck with us mm. and we're now looking to, to begin filming on that probably in September. Right well let's um, let's I guess jump in with Sunderland until I die because I'd, I mean I'd like to start off with a very personal story I was watching an episode I obviously I'll go straight in guys I binged it completely binged it um, in the space of a day or two um, and um, I was watching an episode one day and my, my girlfriend happened to join me just to sit down and watch a bit of football for a rare change and um, as soon as the song started that song that's just absolutely incredible she started to cry and um, <laughs> I just thought I just wanted your thoughts really initially how did that song come about by the late poets and how, it just fits perfectly? Well, so the story is that uh, we had originally agreed to collaborate with Dave Stewart on the music. So Dave Stewart from the Arithmetic, who is from Sunderland and right. is a Sunderland supporter. Um, as it transpires, he wasn't involved long term in the project, but he produces a number of local artists, one of which is, is the late poets, Marty Longstaff. And so he sent through some demo copies of uh, songs from these local artists. So I had to listen to them. Just, I guess we were thinking, could we use some of them in the series? And this was series one somewhere. Um, and it didn't, none of them really work. But this one just sort of stuck in the back of my mind for a while. Mm. And uh, I listened to it a few times and, and went back to it. And then the more I listened to it, the more I thought, this this one resonated mm. and so that's kind of how it started it started with the song mm. and then the graphics came afterwards but i liked i liked the lyrics it resonated with with the city with the football club mm. and so everything was was built around that and it was a big risk because i didn't really tell anybody <laughs> even on the production team too much about the music mm. and we certainly kept it fairly quiet from Netflix, mm. because of the complexity of the graphics, and they took four months to make, uh, it was a big risk because not only the length of the title sequence, but also the fact that it was all entirely animated 
Mm. But I had to go all in on this and hope to, that they liked it and that people, uh, unfortunately, people have liked it. Mm. I mean, it was really Richard's vision on that. I mean, I, he, I remember hearing the song and being like, I can, I like it. Um, I can kind of see what you're talking about. But uh, yeah, like, it was a bit of a like, as he said, because we had to do so much graphics on it. It was a bit of a leap of faith, but it was really Richard guided that through and mm. had a vision for it. It was, uh, it came out very, uh, very well. If you think about most other documentaries in this genre, Mm. The images are of goal celebrations and action, and it's very sort of guitar heavy and lots of drums. Mm. This is just a guy, I say just because it's an amazing song and it's incredibly evocative, but it's mm. just a guy with a guitar. Mm. And, and the images are not, I really love this idea of giving, some, giving people something they're not expecting. Yeah. So less about strong footballing images, but more about iconography of sure. the city building up this, this this journey ultimately to the stadium because that's you think about the idea that all roads in Sunderland lead to the stadium of light mm. was, was that was that then uh, as you touched on Richard I, I sort of did you, you hear the song and then that helped some feed some of the thematics for the show itself or was it always going to be that uh, people orientated people of Sunderland as opposed to necessarily the football because Amanda and I were talking before before you guys joined us and we talked about that actually the, what makes it stand out for us is that it's not necessarily about the football you know if you look at the all or nothing series or other ones which is about the technical advancements of the football team it's mm-hmm. it's much more about it's about the people of Sunderland ultimately um, okay. what did it feed from the song or was it always in the mind to do it like that um well, I think it was it was a bit of a happy coincidence, really. It certainly wasn't the you know the, the full intention going into it. Because I think I think when you enter into this, you, you probably think that the, the focus is going to be primarily on the football club. But I think I think with documentaries of this nature, as a, as a program maker, you're always problem solving. And when you when you've got a football club that's not having a good season, uh, getting access players, to staff, mm. uh, to people in the organisation becomes increasingly more difficult. So doors are closed in your face. So as a programme maker, you've got to think laterally about how to tell your stories. And so mm. if you can't naturally tell a story through the, the playing side of things, then you look elsewhere. And so I think as, as the series developed, the fans played more and more of a role. And... I think you know you were talking about um, you know the football clubs that that you support. The team that I support is Aston Villa, mm. and and Villa and Sunderland have an awful lot of similarities. I mean, it's almost uncanny. Mm. And I quickly uh, realised how important the role of the supporters were. That actually, I hadn't been to the northeast before, so I'm, you know, unlike Ben and, and and the other boys who are you know. A lifelong Sunderland supporters. I had no affinity with the place, mm. so I was coming in it from a standing start. But I, I really quickly realised how important the football club is to the community. Mm. I think cities that only have one football club, they, they, they are very special for for those reasons. And so, you understand that the the, the football club and the city are entwined. If the if the football mm. club is doing well then the community is doing well. People are spending money in mm. bars, restaurants. People walk around with a smile on their face. Mm. But when they're not, it has a direct and immediate impact mm. on, on the community and the economy. So I was fascinated, and I have to admit that when Villa were going through their tough times, I, I wasn't going to games. So I, was, I, was, I did wonder, I wanted to know why and the supporters kept going back because it wasn't just that season that was bad. They'd had a number of seasons yeah, exactly, prior yeah. to that, that that weren't good. What What is it about supporters that makes them go back when sometimes they know they're going to lose games or they know they're going to, to see a poor performance? Mm-hmm. You're looking for a sense of escapism with, with sport and football in particular and there was no escapism there at all. Or, or maybe there was, but that, that's what I guess I wanted to find out. I mean, some of my earliest memories as not being a Sunderland fan myself, but I can rem- I can recall the the playoff final that's written in folklore. You know, the Michael Gray miss penalty four four at Wembley. You've got the Kevin Phillips Niall Quinn link up. I just thought um, Ben, as lead on on the project, but also being a huge Sunderland fan yourself, what was the challenge 
to somehow shine some light on a football club that, quite fra- dare I say, has gone through some very, very dark, miserable times in the last 10, 15 years, coming down from the Premiership, then going down into League One. Um, w- what was the biggest challenge for, for you? In terms of making it? Yeah. In that sense. Well, I mean, the making it side of it, the, the, the drama makes for, does make for compelling viewing. Um, and it was more difficult selling it on that basis because there was a moment where everyone wanted like clubs at the top end of the Premier League, and we had to make the case that this is way, you know, way more interesting. <laughs> Something we're going to be more interesting. Um, I've said this in other interviews, of course. I've said it, I hate repeating myself, but we, I've stood there uh, or sat there, or wept or sat and lay in the fetal position at Sunderland, hearing our fans sing, "We're by far the greatest team the world has ever seen," and you know having a bit of sort of irony in it and being like, oh, do we sound like idiots singing this? Through this series, we can, I can confirm that Sunderland are by far the greatest team the world has ever seen <laughs> and making a documentary series about. I mean, it was unbelievable. The challenges in that when you're making it, as Richard said before, that actually people don't really want you there at that time. It's not mm-hmm. because they're going against you, but because they feel incredibly vulnerable and shown up and everyone wants to look good. So, mm-hmm. And they know they're looking bad. Um, I think that got easier in series two because they understood no matter how much you tell them, mm. they, it takes a while for people to really, and I think that footballers are so used to quite a hostile media and sort of being like saying something and it's like they've been caught out, caught out and they don't tend to watch a lot of observational documentaries that try and get to the soul of the people in it. So to try and explain what you're trying to do, they need to see it back first. But, but in terms of the challenges, I think, you know, what, it's it's often the way in documentary you build a very strong bond with people um the moments that are the most interesting are the ones that are most difficult to capture and that's when you really lean on that relationship and richard did such a brilliant job of building those relationships mm-hmm. so they were robust enough mm-hmm. um to, to it, get it, those moments was it something you were aware of um ben being a Sunderland fan the, the point that rich made around that actually people yeah. use the club or use football um very much as an escapism or as a stability mm. in in their life i mean you've got that very evocative opening sequence in the very first episode in the church and actually it's a sort of another obviously um, symbol of stability and yeah. actually throughout the series um sort of it, it reminded me of sort of like uh the loneliness of the long distance runner kind of stuff, you know, in terms of actually, you know, this is what we know. This is what we, we come to like to give us some positivity here. Cause otherwise yeah. we're really stuffed. You know? Totally. Well, I think that it, it, sport is a, is a catharsis for people. Mm. And I, and I, and I, we, we, we've spoken about it a lot between us about what that, what it does for you. And, 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 and there's quite an interesting thing because you care about it as much as you care about things that actually affect your life. Like mm. people will say that was the best moment of my life when you know Arsenal won and Michael Thomas scored that goal it was the best moment of my life. Like, you know, it's got, actually got really nothing to do with them in a way. It's you know, but it, but it is a genuine moment that, mm. that stands out in your life. Yeah. So, but it's like interesting what that is for people because it's like something you can care about that much, but it's not really your fault if it goes wrong. And you can be mm. utterly partisan and completely intractable and impractical about things. And in a way, what one of the what, what it stands out to me, or one of the problems in the world at the moment, is people are putting that kind of tribalism across the board in places mm. where it doesn't belong, mm. where you actually need to have more nuance. Um, and for for us as fans making this series and seeing the inner workings of the club, you end up being quite conflicted because you basically want to stand there and scream that the chairman's an arsehole. And in series one, Martin Payne, what are you doing to our club? When you actually chat to him and you see what he's up against and where his hands are tied and what he's trying to achieve, and mm. of course he cares. Like, you know, he, mm. he might not seem like he does, but it's a big personal failure in his professional life mm. if the club screw up, even if he doesn't care about the club, which he does. You suddenly become incredibly conflicted and it sort of ruins the catharsis of standing there just yelling, <laughs> yeah. yelling abuse or just, you know, spending 90 minutes yeah. disagreeing with everything that the ref has said. Like, he must have got some of it right. I don't care because I'm just going to hurl loads of you. Yeah, this, this is my moment where I'm meant to be absolutely no, nothing to blame here. I'm meant to be shouting yeah. at you. Let me shout at you. Exactly. It's your fault. Mm. Um, you know, yeah. it's not shining and the light anywhere else that. closer and to home. And you can't do that anywhere else. You can't do that with your family. You can't do that in the workplace, even if you're fully right about everything. Mm. You don't get that kind of like thing 
that football does for you. Well, it reminds me of the the, 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 the Coleman and fan altercation in the first season that was just yeah. absolutely yeah. gripping, like a minute or so of, of footage. Um, I just wondered if what the transition between season one and season two, I felt there was a slightly more positive or less less toxic feel to season two mm. in terms of the the place. Would you would yeah. you agree as part of the editing part of that as well? Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think I think inevitably. I mean, the new owners coming in I think mm. helped clear the slate so mm. before a ball had been kicked there was there was a sort of sense of optimism and I think it was a, it was almost a case of anybody but but Ellis Short mm. um, although I, you know I think what Stuart and Charlie and Juan to an extent uh, set out to do w- was to was to look at what happened in the previous regime and say right well we're not going to do it that way uh, again, I mean, you know, bizarrely, this happened at Aston Villa when Randy Lerner came in. They said, right, what we're going to do is, we, you know, we're going to communicate with fans. We're going to set up a way of of, of basically giving uh, fans a, almost a direct channel to to, to the owners to, to, mm. to let us know what you're feeling, what we what we what we can do differently. And I think what, one of those examples was the changing of the seats. It doesn't sound like much on the surface, mm, but mm, mm. Sunderland having pink seats was a symbol of decline. Yeah, and and not only by changing the seats, but also by having an initiative where the fans could come in alongside the players and the staff. Yeah, it was all built up to feel like the club, the fans had got their club back, and they felt. Mm connected with the football club and that way the community felt reconnected although they were in league one that they felt better about what what was to come and and to you know to approach a new season with a sense of vigor and optimism and actually on the field as well despite the fact that they basically had to rebuild an entirely new team yeah. they started out very well and 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 the sun was shining even in the northeast and <laughs> Everyone was filled with this great sense of optimism, and mm. and I think that transferred onto onto the pitch. I wonder, as I was going to say, that that connection piece is is really interesting because, you know, even in in what it's relatively, and we will take this on the chin, a slight ivory tower of being an Arsenal fan. Um, the cancellation of uh, our AGM, so our annual general meetings with with, with fans and fans forums, it, it has led to a slight malaise and dis, um, detachment from what we feel was what we know to be our club. And and actually, the you know to have that connection, irrespective really of whether the the stuff on the pitch is going well, mm. um, you know you, you you kind of feel like well actually we're in this together again, um, and actually if we get relegated again or actually we just you know don't mm. win anything this year, we're not doing that together at least. Um, totally. But you know what? Just regarding Arsenal, because I, I you know I was telling you guys before that I've got can, I, I know the guy who runs the community project there. <laughs> They are doing amazing things in the community at the moment, like mm-hmm. distributing food and taking care of, mm-hmm. of their people. It's like weird because I, I, Arsenal as a club, I think, on the football side of it, has kind of drifted away from the fans a bit. You know, the, the, the glory days of, of, mm-hmm. of Michael Thomas and David Rowcastle, they were like a real homegrown team. There was a real connection with that team on the pitch. But the community stuff that goes on there is, is yeah. quite amazing. It's astounding. Yeah, it really is. Really there's a fan, I think there's a fantastic push in that department in the football now with community projects. I mean, yeah. we have yeah. a we have a partnership with uh, Football Beyond Borders, who is a, a charity that seeks to sort of engage young people back into education through football. Um, yeah. And I think it's such a, a great ch- social vehicle for change, really. Um, yeah. But like we were saying a minute ago, at board level, like Tom's point about oh, Arsenal is so yeah. true. You know, you've, you've there's this huge detachment now, particularly at Premier League level. It's lovely to see in your in your show that at Sons of Football Club, that that is still alive and, and kicking. Yeah, as I say, has that been part of the impact? Have you have you seen that, Ben, from fellow Sunderland fans that actually on the back of uh, Sunderland till I die, that actually there's almost be uh, <laughs> to go down the religious route again, a reaffirmation or another connection that they've made with the club on the back of it? Because I, I personally, if I felt saw that about Arsenal, um, I would feel that. Yeah, I, th- I think there's a it's very it's com- Sunderland fans have a complicated relationship with the club. And Stuart and Charlie really like part of what was interesting about it, and in the context of kind of Brexit Britain, which is what we were making it in, the I- the idea of these kind of toffs coming up from the south, or po- you know posh boys. I'm not doing them quite enough justice, but if we're talking archetypes coming up from the south in Oxfordshire to kind of mm. get involved in Sunderland, and there they, they, there was that kind. Of, they did get swept up in the romance. Mm. Of, you know, that it's actually something quite nice about football that does cross the class divide a bit, and actually. Mm. There's a there's a there's a there's a romance towards it that was amazing. I right? <laughs> go back. We keep going back for more, yeah. uh, but we're quite prickly with it. And so like so the result of the season, I think 
I certainly feel that people from the northeast feel good about seeing themselves represented. Mm. We all believe our club is special, and it feels like people around the world agree with that now. And for us, putting something out there, you know, because I grew up in London, so for me personally, it's a bit of a love letter to. Mm. I might have a slightly romanticised view of the northeast. I grew up thinking, I wish I didn't live in Camden Town. I wish I lived in Sunderland. You know what I mean? I don't know. It was, it was, mm. That was next, next. Sunderland was next to heaven for me. Everyone was Sunderland kids and supported Sunderland and was obsessed by the one thing I wanted to talk about. And so, and it, and it's a bit. So I've got a bit of a romanticised image of it, but it's very. I think the fans feel proud of the series and really happy. And I, but I, in terms of their connection to the board and the club, it's very mm. complicated at the moment because I think Stuart and Charlie. They, they, it, it's, it's a still a business decision for them. Ultimately, it's millions of pounds of their own money mm. in either direction at stake. So, mm. Mm. that growing pressure, Rich, as well, to to to, to accurately reflect reflect the people of Sunderland. I imagine when you start out on on, on the mission, it's like, it's like you said at the beginning to shine a microscope under the football club. But actually, the the, the you know, as we went into second in second series, was there a growing? Did you feel a growing sense of pressure to accurately reflect that that, that portrayal? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I think we want to accurately reflect everything that we've we filmed and and portray it also in a way that is neutral. You know, it's not up to us as program makers to mm. put an angle on something. It's mm. up to the viewers to make up their mind whether they felt Martin Bain had done uh, a good job under difficult circumstances or whether they felt that he did have the club's best interests at heart. That's not for us or you know Stuart and Charlie players that you know the players care about the club or not we're just we're just trying to lift the lid I think with the fans it is actually very interesting now you've mentioned it because at the end of the first uh series I you know I looked at how we had portrayed the fans because you know it's not always black and white and it certainly isn't in Sunderland Mm. there's a hell of a lot of nuance there in terms of um the, the passion of the fans and um, it's a tr- it's a tricky one because I think even after two years, I still you know you can ask Ben as well about about Sunderland fans, but I still haven't quite <laughs> put my finger on it because when you're there and when you go to the games and when you spend a lot of time in Sunderland, so much of what people talk about is the football club. That there's so much written in the press. Mm. the pressure on the players and anybody connected with the football club is incredibly intense mm. um, that it's almost impossible to really get that those subtleties in, mm. into a program of six or eight episodes, even over two series. So I think it, it's a constant evolution really mm. in terms of the fans that their mm. relationship with the football club is one that is so intense, is so passionate that's why it makes it. Did you enjoy that late night with the Will Gregg transfer, Richard? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, that, that to me, again, <laughs> the way that it panned out was quite interesting. So I remember talking, because I spent quite a, a lot of my time with Stuart and with Charlie, and I remember talking to them, I think, probably in December, and I'd already started to plan ahead what the January transfer window might potentially look like because obviously it's a big story for us. And, and I remember saying to me, because at that stage, October, November, actually things were going very well on the pitch and Stuart mm. turning to me and saying, I don't think we're going to do any business in January. Uh, and then as we got closer and closer, he started to I think, well, I think we might get one or two reinforcements. And then, of course, about a week out, after Josh Madger had decided that he was going to leave, all hell broke loose. And I think we knew that we were either heading for a uh, deadline day or at the very least going up pretty close to it. Mm-hmm. So by the time it came to about a couple of days out, I said, right, in series one, we had seen players coming into the football club. But by that stage, the deal is 95% of the way done. I really wanted to see if we could get behind the scenes on how a football transfer actually transpires. Mm. So we, you know, we very deliberately positioned a camera with with Stuart at his offices in Oxford, uh, with Tony Coton, the, the you know the chief scout, uh, head of recruitment, and, and Charlie Methven in Sunderland, mm. and also another camera with Nick Barnes mm. uh, at the BBC in Newcastle just to see how that, that evening played out. And um, 
hopeful that, um, that you know that we did a reasonably good job at, at covering that. I was saying to Tom before we came on air actually that as Arsenal fans, I never thought that. I'd ever watch a season review of a, of a Sunderland um, season. It's just fascinating how you've managed to just grip football fans across the country with a, with a, a team that they have no affiliation with. It's it's phenomenal, really. And um, I think it is that level of literally unfettered access yeah. um, that potentially we've not seen. You know, we've all seen season reviews, but essentially that's just highlights of games. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. actually think being able to see the mechanics of, of how a club... Mm works but also doesn't work that fallibility at the minute as well mm. you know there's the you know that actually that you know there are still the emails that need to be sent there's still people running across corridors mm. um when deadlines are being pushed through mm. it's not some seamless big money machine yeah. or football that i think really resonates with fans i wonder um, if it's going to change the face of the, the whole sort of football documentary slash season review you know well that's what i was going to say in terms of um, you know we're also seeing things with like the last dance and you know that that mm. and how big that is right now that actually that people are just going to almost demand demand that access um to, yeah. their, to their sporting idols and teams now aren't they mm. yeah well it's interesting. mentioning the last dance is, is interesting because i guess as program makers we we'll, we'll always face a challenge with access but if you actually if you look back at quite a lot of sporting documentaries from 10 20 years ago you actually see that the access is there uh, you know, the the famous Bobby Robson, Graham Taylor documentaries of the past. The Last Dance is extraordinary because you mm. cannot believe that all of this footage exists and yet we've mm. never seen it before. It's astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. That, that, mm. that is that is the, the joy of this. Is, and also, I think I think in a way, a little bit like suddenly it sort of takes us back to, you know, to, to an era when, you know, growing up, we were watching these these kind of sports and we loved it. And also, Jordan is just a, Nominant. It's very watchable. Yeah. Uh, but I think, uh, again, we don't want to pedal it too much, but um, I, I think you're right. And we, we, we obviously enjoy the 89 film, uh, the Arsenal story of, of 89, and obviously mm-hmm. the victory of Liverpool. And I, I think similarly, like you, you hit on a good point, Rich, that people were actually probably more connected to the clubs then. The Arsenal bus came back and then partied in the snooker club with fans. I'm not sure that would be uh, the case now. And, and you know, the last dance, you've got members on their plane, private planes on their buses doing these interviews. And actually, to, to keep that under wraps till now is probably part of the fascination. But do we get to a point where some clubs are going to sort of um, try and put some barriers up? I know some still don't want to have the kind of documentary that Man City have had and obviously Sunderland have had. But actually, would it be something that the the viewer and, and the customer and therefore the fans of the club ultimately demand that they have back from their clubs? Well, I mean, I, I, I think my view on it is, is that the social media at football clubs now is expanding quite rapidly. So I think I think there's I, I know that it's, it's very much filtered. But I do think fans get get a reasonable insight into their football club through, through those channels. I mean, in a way, I'd hate to see a world where every single football club has got a behind the scenes or or this type of documentary because, mm. you know, it, it's very hard to to keep regenerating. I think one of the mm. one of the big challenges you face with making this type of documentary is that it is linear in its in its nature in terms of the narrative, and so to avoid it feeling just like that end of season DVD review. <laughs> You you have to keep um, you know thinking of of, of the storyline and, and mm. where is it going. You can't just go right here's one match and here's another match and yeah. especially if the team's winning all the it time. Needs to be a narrative, doesn't it? You, yeah. You've got mm. to have that that narrative and uh, and obviously sport is is incredibly unpredictable. So mm. if you mm. were to go with a team that just finished mid table, didn't go anywhere in any cup competitions, and actually was very very well run off the pitch, didn't have any players like Darren Gibson didn't miraculously sign for them halfway through the season, it really wouldn't give you very much. Or certainly yeah. as program makers, you'd really have to go go digging for it. So there are an awful lot of pitfalls with with approaching the, this type of program. How, how has it differed, Ben, from sort of other productions that Full World have done? I'm thinking sort of, you know, Class of 92 stuff, and obviously that's more film. But in terms of what are the key differences from your perspective there? Uh, well, something like Class 92, you're telling a story retrospectively. Um, so, and actually, it's very, Class 92 is quite, we didn't actually film that much. We did a day when we had them all together um, and they played, a, they played that game at the cliff and then we went out for dinner with them. 
Um, and then we did a day with each of them individually, which was, I mean, one of the some of the greatest days of my of, of my life. <laughs> Even I'm a Sunderland fan, going to the park with Paul Scholes to just ping footballs around. <laughs> not your like, average oh, day, is it? No. Not your average day, though. It's fantastic. So uh, that was great. Um, it, it's more akin to something like the Bolt doc that we did. Mm. You know, we went to the Olympics with him and we spent a year or two kind of mm. basically in, in his camp. You're on the journey. Um, mm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But this one, um, and actually, weirdly, our first ever film in the hands of the gods, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it or seen mm. it. But mm. it a bunch of football freestylers mm-hmm. must have away from London to Buenos Aires. We, mm-hmm. we knew, like, we didn't know our asses from our elbows at that point. I mean, we probably don't now. We've just about figured it out um, on a biological level. But, um, <laughs> but we really, like, we, we were very, like, green and we just followed these kids. But actually, it was quite similar to just, like, go on a journey with with with, with people. Mm. Um, the, 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 it's an interesting process to make something over a year like that. Um, over such a long period of time where you're trying to put a lot of the different stories together, um, getting the structure of it and the way you make it right was really interesting. Because in, in most of the films we've done before, there's a much more conventional director, producer, mm. hierarchical structure. On something like this, it's too big for one person really to be all the way across. Mm. Um, and it, and like understanding how to make the show was a, was a real process for us, very rewarding process. Um, and uh, but it but it is quite it, it's interesting and it has and I think that really to make something like this great um, or good uh, it needs to reach out beyond the football it needs to like touch on a theme in fact when we we something like Class ninety two or Hands of the Gods but sports documentaries weren't such a big deal back then and pitching them was really hard and people would always say to us well why do I want to watch a sports but why do I want to watch the Class ninety two like it's never going to be as mm, good as them mm, winning the Champions League in the mm, last minute mm. and you don't know. Mm. about it so what's the point of this um and we were and the, the answer to that question was always that it touches on something bigger than just the sport um and mm. so we're always looking for that when we go and make it and in order to accomplish that you sort of have to remain open to what the story has to tell you mm. and in Sunderland's case it was actually you know you want to watch a manager in full flow go watch go uh, go, go and watch yeah. man city because that guy's a brilliant manager yeah, yeah. Not, that, not that the managers in Sunderland weren't brilliant managers but then mm. that, that, the, if you had have just seen what the inner workings of something going out to grind out a draw with Doncaster mm. are, mm. I don't know how fascinating that is. Whereas what was on the table was a much something mm. you know more about communities and. Yeah, I think what you say is right, Ben, because we think of this actually as a documentary, but mm. you know, plain and simple, it, mm. it, it just happens that football is at the heart of the subject matter, but it, it mm. is a documentary. Mm. You know, I think that I find that there is a difference between a sports documentary and a documentary. And I think we we certainly strive to achieve the latter. And we are we doing a we doing we, it's akin to sports journalism. I mean, you, I'm sure you guys read the papers and there there are journalists you love, and the, the mm. day after they just connect mm. what just happened to something much bigger. And or, you, mm. know, mm. you know, I was asked about but you thought, even someone that you read like Nick Hornby. Mm. It was like uh, it just connects yeah. that experience yeah. to something way bigger. And yeah, I suppose as well. Just just how football is is a is a part is a, a big part of some one person's life. A, a, a documentary is a sort of a a bigger part of what what it's trying to achieve, isn't it? That that Richard touched on there. The whole football is the centerpiece, but actually the documentary yeah, well, around it is what tells the story. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, the, the reason I say that, uh, not because it makes it sound any cleverer. I think. The reason is just that these are ultimately, whether people like it or not, or whether this is their the, what they set out to do or not, they, they are character driven. Mm. And it's like any mm. story. If you don't identify with the characters, sure. if you don't like those characters, you will not want to go on that journey with them. You will not want mm. to sit down for eight mm. episodes and, and watch how things turn out for them, yeah. for better or for worse. Mm-hmm. You have to be able to do that. And if you've got a bunch of dislikable characters on your screen, you mm. will switch it off. You, you know, you guys have studied film before. You know, Godfather, which I think is an appropriate comparison to Sunderland today. Right? Is uh, you know, it's a, it's, is it, it's a gangster that. film. It's yeah. a gangster film, but it's a film about family ultimately. You know what I mean? And that, and the depth of that, those relationships and those characters is what makes it stand mm. out from all the other ones. Mm. Mm. 
and for, for for me watching it what really stood out was how 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 true to life and how real it was because ultimately you you see a lot of these uh sporting films rather than the documentary angle are, are typically uh, focused around the, the glory and success and mm. therefore but actually you know mm. life mm. isn't necessarily winning is it i mean you know no one gets out alive yeah. and actually akin to football 90 percent of it is actually losing um, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and, and yeah. to see that in real you, you're rooting not if you're a Liverpool fan. To get their ten percent, <laughs> yeah, to yeah. get their ten percent, and yeah. I think you're rooting for no, the Sunderland fans as much as you are the team mm. by the end. Of it. Yeah, because we're, we're and we're always told, aren't we, as young, as young people growing up, it's oh, it's all about winning and losing. It's about winning and losing, but actually, it's yeah. we're we're not, we're, not, we're not showed maybe that balance through sports journalism maybe mm. as much. It's about the winning and the glory and the lifting the trophy mm. too much. I think that's spot on. I mean, we we spoke about it a lot about the fact that basically the sun when we're talking about it reaching out beyond the uk most sports fans see their team lose ultimately mm. one you know one team mm. in the premier league one team wins it 19 of them go home empty-handed mm. yeah. so like that's mm. what's more that's what's way more relatable mm. Mm. far more relatable yeah it's true and in america they don't even have a relegation of course no yeah, mm. yeah. No, they, and, and so they don't have draws either so. So, you know, I mean, ultimately, someone, yeah. someone loses all the time. They're trying to find the loser as much as they are the winner. Yeah. It, it has been interesting, though, you know, looking at uh, other countries, uh, especially places like America, Australia, and, and in South America, that the connection actually with um, South America is quite interesting. I'm not sure whether you, you know about it. I'll, I'll mention it in a minute. But, in, you know, in places like America, they've said, how good would it be if we had relegation and they would already start to identify the team that they thought in the NFL mm. who were closer to Sunderland you know Cle- the Cleveland Browns were often the one mm. that, that came up came up the most mm. um no in, in, in South America uh Peter Farrer a uh, taxi driver who, who features in, in both series is now yeah. linked up with uh with River Plate and uh, they've invited him out to Buenos Aires to Wow. Go and take in a match and, and join the the, the president of the club oh, during amazing. a game. <laughs> is, is <laughs> on the basis that um, yeah, on the basis that they they see so many similarities in their fan base and, and yeah. communities. And of course, historically, it was a lot of shipbuilders from Scotland and the North East who mm. established a lot of the football clubs in South America. Yeah, yeah, down the pit or yeah, or, or on the shipyard. Yeah, actually, mm. to quote to quote that fan himself, it's crackers, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> actually, uh, the football football in Argentina as well. It's very. I do find it similar in a way that the the whole religious fanatical aspect of Argentinian football. I, I watched a Boca Juniors documentary, I think, on Netflix a few weeks yeah. back, mm. um, and there are lots of similarities there. Um, yeah, uh, appreciate you mentioned earlier just a couple of things before we wrap. Um, uh, they think some things are under wrap, but is there any sort of uh, new projects that either you are working on that you wanted to uh, give us a little snippet of or, or, or shout out at mm. least? Um, well, we're doing a uh, we we're doing a show with Jack Whitehall um, at the moment, uh, but it talk because since all the sport was cancelled this summer, although some of it's going to come back a little bit, um, we had this notion to. And and because we're kind of into sports journalism and the bigger picture of what sport talks about, and because I think in this coronavirus thing we've been stuck at home, and but weirdly felt more connected to each other by the fact that we're all missing. Yeah. We've forgotten how annoying traffic is, and just think it'd be really <laughs> nice to see somebody. Um, we we sort of putting together this uh, six part series of it's going to be on BBC One. Um, I think it starts in July, where each week he tries to get a sense of like Britain through our relationship to sport. So like why we're so into underdogs. Oh, you know cool. What I mean? Why do we love Tim nice. Henman more that than Andy Murray? Good, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So like, you know, what, what the hell's going it's on? Still Henman Hill. It's still yeah, Henman I was going to say, is it a Tim Henman biopic? <laughs> totally, yeah. actually, and, and how everyone was like with Andy Murray, it's like, God, this guy's got to lighten up. Then he tells a joke about wanting England to lose. And everyone's like, prick. Yeah. As soon as Andy yeah. Murray won a, as soon as Andy Murray won a slam, everyone just sort of switched off. Didn't totally. He's a winner now. We don't really embrace. Race our winners. Lewis Hamilton, no. Andy Murray. No, no, no. Give us Tim Henman. You know, give it. us Tim Henman. Um, so it's, so yeah. that should be really good fun. And that's kind of building on all those things that we've spoken about, about trying mm. to find something bigger through sport. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Yeah, no, absolutely. We'd love to um, We'd love to finish off, guys, both of you, with our counter-attack challenge on HDO football. We're going to sure. fire some qu- questions at you. We'd like the shortest possible answers, if, if that's doable. Yep. One word, yeah. two words. Um, Tom's going to kick us off. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, so, so both of you, what's your best slash favourite sports documentary of all time? When we were kings. 
Nice. Uh, Senna. Series yeah. one or series two of Sunderland till I die. Good one. Um, I'll let you go first, Ben. <laughs> no, I'll say, say I'll say I'll say series two. Two. Because there are some unreal high points uh, in it. If you can answer from Sunderland and Villa um, respectively, if you were going to sign Messi or Ronaldo, who would you rather have at your club? Who's your favourite of the two? Oh. Ronaldo. Ronaldo. <gasps> We've been on such a journey with him. I used to hate him and now I love yeah. him. <laughs> your favourite Netflix show that you've binged maybe in the last few weeks other than Sunderland obviously can I say it's not on Netflix today, but my favourite show that I've binged for ages is a show called Dave it's on iPlayer okay <laughs> it's, it's That's fine. brilliant you can have it yep Ozark oh, yeah. Ozark Ozark's night I've, I've heard such good things I've not oh. seen it yet and yeah. I've heard such good things um, last dark. couple it um, is dark <laughs> 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 well, the, the, the clouds have come over today. It might be. It might have to be done. Um, last dark, couple, Sunderland, brilliant. Sunderland, or, or slash Villa to win the Premier League, or England to win the World Cup. Wow, Villa, Villa to win anything over England. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I always say Arsenal to win a corner over England. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ben, you're really going Sunderland. Oh, you're going Sunderland. Okay. Yeah. And, and lastly, um, you can have two dinner guests each, dead or alive, from the sporting and or media creative world um, for, your, for yourselves. Which two dream dinner guests each? Oh, wow. Great one. Um, Charlie Chaplin. Um, I'm just obsessed by Charlie Chaplin. Um, and Len Shackleton. who was uh, <laughs> Actually, Len Shackleton used to call a great goal against Arsenal back in the day. Yeah. That's a, that's yeah, a different, the end then, didn't you? Yeah, yeah that's a different <laughs> yeah. evening as well. That's a different evening, isn't it? Charlie well, Chaplin, yeah. <laughs> Richard, what about yourself? Okay, so I go for Ken Burns, uh, yep. documentary maker, famous documentary nice. maker, and Jack Grealish, because I would love to know what the hell he was doing, telling everybody, <laughs> everyone to stay in, and then the next day, <laughs> buggering off out. <laughs> in his car at 7am or whatever it was. Yeah. Okay. So again, that'd be a different evening, wouldn't it? I, I'm, I'm um, fascinated to know what, what, why somebody can have such a brilliant footballing mind, but when it comes to common sense, <laughs> have absolutely none. Yeah. It's because it's all focused on the football, you know. <laughs> but no, certainly um, not focused on his hair at the moment. Just... He looked like yeah. a vagrant. Well, where, 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 where do you see Jack Grealish going, Richard, in the future? Is, is, he, is he destined for the, the top top, do you think? I, I, think if, I think he should go to Italy. He would absolutely tear up that league. I mean, having mm -hmm. seen quite a few games recently, he would be amazing because, you know, we, we both said we like Ronaldo, and I think partly that's his, his ability, but he's also his aerial ability. Mm -hmm. The thing about Jack Grealish is that he's, he's, he always, if you watch him, he always picks the best pass. Any player overlapping him is never, never has to, you know, take a stride out. They, he, literally, the weight of the passing is amazing. Uh, he mm -hmm. dribbles, he's strong, mm -hmm. actually, he's quick. Uh, you know, he's got an eye for goal in a good mm. in Serie A. You know, if he was playing for someone like mm. Juventus, Milan, Lazio, he would score 25, 30 goals a mm. season easily, mm. easily. But that's probably not where he's going to go. I think if Liverpool have got any sense, they'll take him because mm. he, he he is that good. And I think we, I think as Villa fans, we felt he's that good for the last yeah. three or four seasons. What, what, what are both your thoughts on the whole situation at the moment? Obviously, Sunderland League One. League One seems to be the messiest of all leagues, doesn't mm. it, at the moment, Ben? Yeah, it does seem to be. It does seem to be. I have no idea how it's going to pan out, but they seem to have splintered, which is kind of the worst case scenario and not like going at it together. I mean, we, we talk, we, we're quite into American sports, and it always strikes me that the unity that they have there, even though I'm sure it feels a bit frustrating from the inside, leads to better organisation mm. all round. And I think mm. League One is demonstrating the trouble with the game the other way. Yeah, yeah. And I imagine you would be keen for Villa to restart again and try and get out of trouble? No, no, I just wanted the whole thing to be cancelled. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I know it's, it's a slightly fuzzy. That would be the easiest way for us to get out of this mess. I mean, mm. I think I think the, the, the retest has counted in our favour, well, mainly because we've got John McGinn back <laughs> uh, and everybody's on a standing start. I think we've... we've 
we've got really unlucky that we were basically first up against Sheffield United because if any team is going to be right up for it, it'll be them. Yeah. And I think we'll mm-hmm. know in that very first game whether Villa have got a chance. But I, I sense that I mean things were going so badly wrong yeah. before the break. I, I really struggled to see how Villa are going to get out of this, and then it's yeah. going to be a disaster because the whole team will break up now. No, you're a classic Villa fan, right? <laughs> well, we, we, I, I'd be a bit disappointed if you're really positive and said, "Now you're going to go win four on the spin and get out of trouble." <laughs> because you know any positive? Do you know any positive Villa fans? Uh, I only know one of a, a yeah, true villain fan, and, and he's not, he's not very positive either. So, yeah. no. Actually, actually, Richard, I was thinking, the, the, I'm sure the Premier League team of the season would have been pretty much the whole Liverpool side. But John McGinn, if he, if he'd have stayed fit, I think he he could have got in there. Actually, he's an outstanding season. Yeah, yeah, he he is fantastic, and I think you know we'll lose McGinn, we'll lose Mings, we'll lose Grealish, and a few others. Um, mm. Yeah, so we're we're pretty much back to square one if mm. or when we go down. Yeah. Villa till I die will be chalked yeah. up and you'll be away. There you go. <laughs> Season one. Yeah. Really have another hit on the hands. <laughs> Sadly, Christian Perz though I think is too uh, too much of a control freak to ever let something like that happen. You'll have to get you'll have to get Charlie over to do the entrance music when they come out as well. <laughs> oh, I mean, I, re- I remember sh- I remember shooting that scene and there's there's a few <laughs> things that we didn't we didn't put into that cut, but he it was a. Uh, it was it was a it was a very funny day. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll say that. And, and okay. to, to be fair to Charlie, you know, he was completely up for it. I mean, I think yeah. he knew how potentially he'd come across in that scene. Um, mm. But you know, he 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 was he was he was up for it. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. Fantastic. Yeah. Really no worries. Lovely to meet you guys. And I feel like everything. That was brilliant. Pleasure. See you later, mate. Thanks very much. We've got some exciting news to announce. HTO Football will be running monthly competitions. First up is a podcast shout out and a new copy of Football Paperback Zonal Marking by Michael Cox. Keep an eye on our Twitter page at HTO Football for more details on how to enter. Until next time, take care. Hold up. 